taken from Romans 10, verses 5 to 15. Moses writes, con writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips, in your heart. That is, the word of faith we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call upon one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone proclaiming him? And how are they to proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The path of all great and wonderful is on page 129, page 129 of your prayer book. Please stand as we read the path of all great and wonderful. Great and wonderful are your deeds, Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who shall not reveal and praise your name, O Lord? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence. For your just dealings have been revealed. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, may he pray. Yes. 
to the day we met next Sunday afternoon, to all these to heaven, thinking of, I can't remember what I put on which piece of paper, so that's why you see me looking over, I haven't forgotten how to worship according to our ways. Ritual is part of the parcel of our lives, and because we have trained ourselves and tuned ourselves to be uh, skeptical of that which is ritualistic, we don't like the word ritual. We tend to think, oh, ritual is a bad thing. But if you put the toothpaste on your toothbrush exactly the same way every day, or if you take the teeth out of the glass beside the bed, exactly the same way every day, that's a ritual. Psychologists will tell you that, or anthropologists or whatever, will tell you that's a ritual. When we do stuff the same way on a regular basis, you turn to as everyday rituals. I take my glasses off at night and I put them in exactly the same place on the bedside rocker because I'm blind as a bat and I need to know when I put my hand out in the morning that my glasses are in the same place every day. It's alarm clock, glass opener, uh, and, and uh, glasses uh, all in the same place every single day. So that if I need to find my glasses in the dark, it's only rang the doorbell. I would put my hand out and I know exactly where they are. That's a ritual. Of course, rituals can become crippling to people when uh, they become obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, those are rituals that uh, can, can really take people's lives over and make people think of misery for the next time. Uh, I am a ritual that makes hands like a misery. I'm sure more than one. As soon as I get in the car, I do exactly the same thing every time I get into the car. You see, you get into the car, I pull the door, and I lock the central locking at the same time. Do it every single time I get the central locking gets locked. Okay, I'm not getting in the car. Okay, so I, I lock the car as soon as I get in. Uh, and uh, that's grand, but the thing I'm getting in, Aunt Rachel is to go to 15 charity shops when I sit in the car and wait for her. And I was sitting in the car, the rain will be lashed down, and the doors are all locked, and I'm still up the street, dragging the chest of drawers behind her. Thank you. 
part and parcel of human existence. Part and parcel of how we are and how we survive and what we do in religion and faith. In my Quaker schooling, I knew exactly what was going to happen. You walked into the dining room, you stood behind your chair, and there was a silence for Quaker grace. And then a wee bell would ring everybody sat down. At the end of the meal, the wee bell was on again and everybody stood up again. And there was silence for Quaker grace. That was a Quaker school. That's how it was done. There was a ritual. We knew what the rituals were. There are rituals to how we worship. There are rituals to how everybody worships. We make rituals, uh, and they are important, but we can make things ritualistic. We can make rituals so formulaic that we can't see the wood for the trees. The ritual gets between ourselves and what we want to achieve. That's what happens in everyday life when the rituals become OCD, for example. That people, it comes between the quality of life that people would like to achieve, but it blocks the way. And so it can be in worship. We can make our, our rituals too important. They can be too tied to the perfection and the perfecting of ritual. Uh, we can be too sloppy about it as well, but we can be too tied to it. And it starts to get in the way. It's the same with religious experience and conversion to Christ. We can turn coming to Christ in faith into a ritual. We can make it something that it was never meant to be. So Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. He doesn't say anything about the cross. He doesn't say anything about being washed in the blood of the Lamb. He doesn't say anything about praying a prayer of repentance. He doesn't say anything about the Lord. Now I want you to consider something. First of all, I'll tell you uh, a parable. It's a parable that comes to us from Hinduism, and it's my version of it. You've probably heard better versions of it. A group of blind men. And they heard that there was a creature called an elephant. They'd never seen an elephant clearly, and they wanted to know what an elephant was like. So they were brought to meet a tame elephant. One of them went to the front of the elephant, and he took it by the trunk. And when he was asked later what's an elephant like, he said it's like a hose. The one of them was taking the back of the elephant, and he took the elephant by the tail. He was asked later what's an elephant like. He said the elephant's like a rope. Another one found the front leg. Declaration in its constitution that said there is no God. 
Therefore, people who want to worship God and to be Christian have to become members of what became known as the underground church. They met in secret. They gathered together under the threat of persecution, imprisonment, and quite probably uh, execution in some of those countries. And so there were movements in the West to get to those people resources to help them with worship. And some of those resources were for Bible. You might have read the book that you used by Brother Andrew God's Slaughter, uh, a great thriller of a story about a monk uh, who regularly crossed into uh, the Eastern Bloc taking vandals of Bible to them. And what would happen in many of those countries was we have the testimony of the Christians in those countries that they were getting, as soon as they got a Bible into their fellowship group, they would get a razor blade and they would cut the pages out of the Bible and they were all with the books of the Bible. They were making scripture available to one another and they could roll it up, you know how thin pages are in the Bible, they could roll it up and they could smuggle it from house to house and pass it on from person to person to person. Now here, if you had a third of this time the page of the Bible that told the story of the rich young ruler. And a third of this time, the page of the Bible had John 3.16 on it. And a third of this time, the page of the Bible had Romans 10 on it. We would read three different things about how we come into fellowship with God through Jesus. One of them, the rich young ruler, says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And the rich young ruler says, our Jesus says to rich young ruler, get rid of all that you have and come follow after me. In John 3, he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And in Romans 10, St. Paul says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Repent of the thing that's in the way, but none of those three actually use the word repent, for example. None of them said, Come to the foot of the cross. None of them said, You know, pray a sinner's prayer. None of them said any of those formulae, but they all said in different ways. And God deals with us, and Jesus speaks to different people according to their name. And Jesus speaks to us by His Spirit through the Scripture according to who we are. But there are people around about us who want to hurt us all into the one pen. Who want to make us all chant the same chant. I'm not talking about the chants of the choir that have done in the past. They want us all to cheer the same cheer. They want us all to be able to say the same formulaic thing. And you know it, and I know it, because we've been bothered around the lungs with it since we could understand anything. Now, unless you have prayed a prayer of repentance, Using these words, these words, these words, you are not a Christian. And some of these people have an eye in the middle of their forehead and they can say it, and I show the years and say, You don't think, you don't mean it, you don't have faith, you don't know Jesus. I had someone in a parish once said, Those people in that church, and guess you should talk about when she said those people, those people in that church say the Lord's Prayer, but they don't mean it. Who they heard of? Whether this one, that one, the other, and no one has the right to say to you or me, 
you are not of the kingdom of God because you didn't pray the formula that you heard the evangelistic rally. For some people, that's entirely what they need to pray in that way. But like my mother before me, I can say there isn't a time in my life when I didn't believe in God, that I didn't have faith that Jesus was God's Son, and that I knew that He loved me. I've known that, and I've known it, known it, from the very start. I have knelt down and prayed a prayer and said, Lord, forgive me my sin. But so have you today. We have prayed a prayer of confession. And it's not for me to say whether you meant it or for you to say whether I meant it. What does Paul say? If you go that page, there's no mention of a cross. No mention of a cross or a crucifixion or blood or sacrifice or atonement or anything else. He says, but if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But in a few minutes we say that three people confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. If you believe these things in our heart, and the things that we say with our lips, in and of themselves, yes, they're good children. But these are sacred words. If we believe them in our heart, if we hold them as true in our heart, if we hold them dear and, and we pray to God throughout our lives and say, you know, God forgive me, there's a prayer that comes to us from the Eastern Church, it's called the Jesus Prayer. And the Jesus Prayer is a prayer that is said in a ritual fashion by members of the Orthodox Church. Instead of sitting foot on their thumbs, the monks will say this prayer over and over again. In the moments when they're not doing other things or speaking to other people, they would pray, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then what do they pray next? Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we, of course, immediately come, I've got some lip and stop. Not for me to say. There may be times it's just good children. Maybe times it's just going over. There will be other times when we would have prayed, Oh, may the most merciful Father, when we would have prayed, Heavenly Father, forgive me, when we would have said, Lord, forgive me a sinner, for nobody else is saying, but the state of my salvation or your salvation is, and we inflict this upon ourselves, and it is inflicted upon us, and we're told we're not sound, we're not scriptural, we're not all God, and if we're not all God, we must be. We're never going to stop people laughing and looking around us. Let us simply believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and the words that we say with our lips. Let us know that when we have prayed, Lord, forgive my sin, our sin is forgiven. We mean it in our heart and in our mind. The Lord's mercy is greater than my ability to judge it. Thanks be to God that the breadth and depth is greater. Than any formula that any millennial or any one of us can bring to it. And that's thanks, give thanks to God for his enduring goodness to us in Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord. Please stand with me and affirm our faith in you in your prayer on page 105. We will, of course, appear before you on this one. I believe in God. Thank you. 
Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Thank you. 
receiving his blessing, receiving healing, strength, love, and forgiveness. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all forevermore. Amen. Before the blessing and the announce, a couple of announcements just to say next Sunday, uh, the service that's recorded is uh, a diocesan service, uh, but the link will be on the website so there's somebody who can't be here. Um, with us on Sunday morning, or you want to watch that, uh, we recorded that service already for next Sunday, uh, and we go out over our own system as well as across the diocese. Also, next Sunday in the afternoon uh, at 3 30, there is another drive in service at Ballymire. So, if you want to go to that 15 minutes early, and uh, again, there might be a family member who doesn't feel safe coming in. Church. And even though you've been in church in the morning, it might be a good thing to do for them to bring them out in the afternoon and enjoy that time of fellowship there. So that's on my next um, Sunday afternoon. And just a preliminary heads up, I haven't to talk to the parish secretary about this yet. Probably in the next couple of weeks, uh, two to three weeks anyway, we would need to have a select fresh meeting because we need to uh, plan things like how are we going to do harvest. How are we not going to do harvest? Uh, how are we going to do harvest? And how are we going to uh, approach Remembrance Sunday? Things like that have to begin to be planned. Um, the earlier we plan, uh, the better things are. And we hope that things continue in such a way that we can continue to worship. And our worship can continue to grow. That eventually we're going to sing and sit for every month. And where it grows in the front of us and uh, the ministry that you're part of. Let's hope that we are on an upward trajectory, but we just hope we will the present day. So, maintain the faith, and the Lord is going to walk with us in all circumstances. And so, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds the knowledge of the God, the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. I'm going out.